Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I'm Nicolas Rojas. Uh, I'm a lecturer in the Dyson School of Design and Engineering, uh, where I lead the Robotic Manipulation Engineering Design and Science Lab. Um, I am also uh, the module leader of uh, Computing 2. This is a second year <coughs> module where we, uh, our, our students learn about algorithm design and analysis. I am also the co-module leader of robotics research projects that is uh, an elective for our fourth year students where our students learn uh, to do research in robotics. Today I, I'm going to talk about uh, beyond human manipulation. So I am a roboticist and that is my, I can say that is my, my quest and my long-term goal as a robotic researcher. So what we're doing is, is trying to rethink robotic gesture manipulation to surpass the manipulation capabilities that we observe in ourselves, but also in, in, in other animals uh, under different conditions and indeed under all conditions is what we want to, what we want to achieve. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, present what I understand but beyond human manipulation. Uh, trying to put that into the context of robotics. And, and later I'm going to present why that this is, is important for, for industry and for businesses. Uh, later I want to present my approach to solve that problem and how that approach departs from what is mainstream right now in robotics. And finally I'm going to present some of the work that we are currently doing and some of the work that we have done in the past uh, towards this goal. So, in the past, we have already, we roboticists, we designers and engineers working in robotics have conquered what is called automation in structured environments. And automation in, the, under, in structured environments are characterized by robotic systems that uh, can collaborate with uh, between them and sometimes with uh, with uh, human co-workers uh, but in general these systems are uh, very fast are precise and are reliable so they work very good as someone told me uh, I think it was last week they they, they look like a, a ballet when 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 you uh, see them in, in in an industry plan and they work very well and we managed to conquer that because as you know that the environment, you can optimize that very well. You can uh, understand the different ramification of the, of, the, of the process that you have, and you can get a very reliable solution. So that was robotics till, let's say, uh, the 80s and, 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 and some point in the 90s. So from then, uh, robotics have been working in trying to replicate human manipulation. And human manipulation is something very difficult to, to replicate. And it is because human manipulation is essentially based on manipulating things under uncertainty and manipulating things that are completely diverse. That is, of course, very difficult. And it's still an open problem. We do not have yet machines that can match what we have. Uh, but my problem is different. My problem is going beyond that. It's going beyond human manipulation. And what is that? Is because I want to combine what we have in the past. I want to combine that precision, that velocity, and the reliability with the ability to perform these operations on dynamic environments. So I focus in this area of here. This is something that, in general, uh, robotics I know are not concerned right now. Uh, they are more focused on here. And, and why I'm doing this is because I think that to solve this problem, you need to think <coughs> from scratch to solve this. I do not think that uh, you can eventually leverage some of the knowledge that we have so far, but I do not see from my experience that we are going to conquer that following that. So I'm going to discuss now why this beyond human manipulation that can be defined as automation in dynamic environments is important. So why these five characteristics that I am discussing there or presenting there are important. These are 
why we need uh, precise robots, resilient robots, fast robots, versatile robots, and reliable robots. What, what is that, the need of that? Um, and I usually use three uh, aspects to, to demonstrate this. The first one is related to uh, productivity and manufacturing. Uh, as you know, uh, in the UK, we need to improve the productivity of our businesses, and not just the productivity, also the manufacturing output of these businesses. And the issue is that the majority of these businesses are uh, small and medium-sized companies, and they are characterized by multi-product, uh, small batches of high quality. This is very, very difficult to make that, very difficult. And in order to solve that problem, we need systems that have these characteristics, that are able to have this uh, capability that we have with humans, but they are fast and reliable, because otherwise we are not going to improve the productivity. The second point is care services. As probably you are aware, we are in an uh, aging society, not just in Europe, in, uh, in many parts of the world we have that problem. That opens many challenges. And, and one of the challenges, of course, taking care of people. Uh, I am a person that builds machines, that builds robots. And I know how difficult it is to have a machine that is uh, reliable 100% of the time. If you want that a machine take care of your family, of uh, some other people, uh, we need this, these machines are reliable. These, these robots are reliable. And um, for that reason, I think it's very important to solve this, this issue. And the third one is the opportunity of having new businesses. Uh, I'm a firm believer that we need uh, more robot hardware companies for many reasons, from an economical point of view, for the amount of, um, uh, in terms of, the, of employment uh, characteristics, we, we, I see that it's important to have these kind of companies, but also uh, because of, uh, I see that there is a lot of uh, space there to make innovation, and I, I do see here in the UK a very good opportunity to have that uh, happening. Indeed, one of, the, one of the companies that is pitching today, that is, uh, is Black Buck, is, is, is led by Chris, uh, is working towards this line. Is making innovation in robot hardware for uh, having new, new companies. So now, uh, let's talk about what, what is happening in mainstream robotics in, in terms of, of, of having, trying to replicate the human hand and, and, and trying to, to have machines that can manipulate as we, 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 we do. So what happens right now is that, of course, we have our hands. These are very powerful tools. These define our society, more or less. So what designers and engineers are doing are following a bio-inspired approach, trying to replicate this hand. And this is a, some part of, 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 the, of, the, of the robotics community. Another groups, other groups, what they do is try to control these very complicated uh, devices to try to, to replicate what we have. Okay? So using data-driven or, or task-specific algorithms. Uh, one of the problems is that, in general, these groups don't know talk between them. But uh, there are other things that I, I see here. Just for a moment, think that we haven't conquered flight, and we follow this approach. So we haven't conquered flight yet. If we follow this approach, what we have is some groups trying to replicate the fastest bird that we have in nature, and uh, other kind of groups trying to develop software to control that. I do not see that as the way that we can do that in dextro manipulation. I think that we need to understand better how dextro manipulation works. And for that reason, I depart from this approach. There is another, other two things that I want to highlight here. Of course, my inspiration is great, but it is based on, on, uh, on evolution that 
Uh, more or less, it's an optimization algorithm based on randomness. It works very well, but can also have uh, some issues. An example of these issues is the larial nerve in animals. This is a nerve that goes more or less from here, goes through your hair and comes back here, just to have a distance of some centimeters. It needs to go through more or less what can be like 80 centimeters in humans. The thing is that that nerve is used to demonstrate that evolution is true. But it's also to show you that it has some problems. So what happens in the giraffe is that this nerve goes all the way, sorry. So all the way from the head to the heart and come back. And what in the dinosaurs, even worse. Okay. So this is just to show you that we need to take by inspiration, but we need to learn first what are the principles that define the things that we are working on. <laughs> the second aspect is in terms of control. <coughs> Elastic elements and passive elements can be used to control your system. Hardware can be used to control your system. And they are, in general, not used. And what I'm doing in my, in my research group is to incorporate these ideas to have what is probably can be seen as a more holistic approach. So what we do is we relax the usual assumptions that are used in robot design and control. And by the usual assumption, I mean uh, essentially anthropomorphism, to try to uh, find new ways that we can solve this problem about how we can conquer beyond human manipulation. In general, I combine uh, mathematical approaches and, and asking what is possible to be built from the models uh, to design new things. And of course, uh, creativity. So I'm going to, I'm going to show some, some example of, of, of the things that we have done so far. Imagine what if your fingers were curved. And the axis of your fingers, this axis that you have here in your fingers, could coincide in a single point. What happens there is that we have what we call the, the spherical hands. In these hands, when you grasp the object, we have demonstrated that, that the center of rotation of that object never changes. What happens when you grasp an object with your hand, when you try to manipulate that, the center of rotation of that object changes as soon as you start to move in. That complicates the control of the system. What we believe with this design <coughs> is that if we simplify that, we can simplify then the control. So we have proposed this design of, you can see of course here, that uh, these fingers are no, are no at all like as, as, as human. So we have here this three finger hand, this hand of here have two your fingers, and this axis of these fingers intersect in a single point. This is one of the, one of the examples that was uh, published on a, couple of years, a couple of years ago. So now imagine that what if you could be able to change your fingertips? Okay. Our fingertips are great, amazing. Okay. Replicating them is very, very difficult. So what are we trying to understand is what is that design principles that we can take from, from the design of fingertips that we could use to improve the design of robot hands? We have demonstrated that there is a trade-off between the softness of the fingertip and the shape, the, the depth of the fingertip that can be used to improve the work space of the object that you can manipulate with the hand. This can be, this can seem like natural, like evident, uh, but the point is that we have demonstrated how you can use that in your design, in your models, to design new and better hands. So this is, in this, in this uh, video, we demonstrate uh, how by changing the softness and, and, the, and the depth of the fingertips, you can obtain 
uh, larger world spaces, but not always. There are some points when you kind of you stop this, the, the improvement. And, and we have proposed some, some models to, to, to obtain that. Now, the question is, in this case, is imagine then your palm is stretchable. And we have proposed the year to gripper. In general, this is a very simple gripper that you can see in many industry plants. The point is that first, this gripper is in general never used for dextrose manipulation. It's just used for fish uh, grasping. So we have demonstrated that if you use a combination, a simple combination of position control and torque control, you can transform that gripper into a dextrose manipulation gripper. And moreover, what happens is that if you are able to uh, have a palm, this half here, that is stretchable, you can enlarge what is possible to be done with this gripper. In this off here, we have started to optimize that, that gripper design. And we have then demonstrated that, indeed, if you eliminate the palm of the hand, you obtain a better design. And in the second case, in this case of here, that the video is not, is not showing because I wasn't able to play the, the video. But what we were showing here is, this is a very interesting approach where we are using just the tactile information for sensors to, uh, to, control the, to control the robot gripper. Finally, I want to present this one. This is our newest work. Robot arms, this robot arm that you see in the industry, are all based on robot arms, on, on, on the human arms. Now imagine that you have a forearm that you can stretch, that you can change. What happens then is that you can change the relation between the axis of, this, of these robots. Is that it has implications in terms of uh, how the robot operates and also open the opportunity to improve the human-robot collaboration with, within the systems. Okay? So this is uh, one of our, our newest uh, works. Um, I need to finish now. So if you are interested, I'm very happy to, to continue the conversation later. Thank you very much.